Okay, good morning, everyone. This is our lecture eight. So before we start, I want to add another clarification about this SSR1 and SSR2, which you will need for your homework one due this Friday. So I got some questions about whether, why some of you found that in the calculation, SSR12 is even smaller than SSR1, which cannot be the case. So here I want to emphasize again that when you compute SSR1, the intercept estimate and the coefficient estimate for predictor one, they are different from the two in the SSR12. So make sure that when you fit SSR, when you calculate SSR1, you are fitting a reduced model that includes predictor one only. And you're not using the coefficient estimate from the model includes both predictors one and two. That's the clarification I want to make again. Okay, and another interesting thing brought up by Evan, Evan Becker here. So by email is something I want to also mention to you. So it's about another way of deriving the MLE. Okay, I'll just write here. So another way of deriving the MLE of the sigma square in the linear model. Okay, so I'll make that explanation to everyone. So it's regarding this issue in linear model, if you recall, we have the MLE of sigma square as defined as one over M, right? Summation I from one to N EI square and EIs are our residuals. So we can, we have derived in our previous lecture to show that this can be written as one over N Y minus X beta hat transpose Y minus X beta hat. So this is just the residual vector and its own inner product. And we can further show that this is equal to one over N Y uh, transpose I minus H Y. So this is our hat matrix. We have derived this before. And then what Evan proposed is to directly compute the expectation based on this to show that this is a bias estimator. Recall that in the class, what we did is that we try to say this for, we give you this fact that this follows a chi-square distribution with M minus P degrees of freedom. And so actually N times this follows, a, so it's just a summation of EI square, follows a chi-square distribution with N minus P degree of freedom. And we say that because a random variable following the chi-square distribution will have its expectation equal to that degree of freedom, then we can say it's biased. We just give you that argument. But Evan said that we can actually compute expectation directly from this formula. So let's take a look. So essentially, here, when we take the expectation, probably I'll just do n times the MLD for simplicity, okay? So this is equal to y hat i minus h y. Because this is a scalar after the multiplication, this is just equal to its trace, okay? So it's equal to the trace of expectation of the trace Y, hat, y transpose one minus H, Y. Okay, and we know the property of trace is that we can always circulate, we can always circle the, the things in the product. So we can move Y to the, to the front. So then we will have expectation of trace Y, Y transpose I minus H. Okay, and then we can separate those into two terms. So the first one we will, so basically here, the I minus H, we know that it's actually, okay, okay probably I should, if I should change trace and expectation. Okay, maybe I'll write it as, sorry, as the trace of the expectation of Y hat I minus H, Y. And then, here we are basically changing the trace and expectation. So I'm going to get y, y transpose 
i minus h because here the expectation is taken entry wise okay okay and then here the thing is that the i minus h as we know is not random h is only a matrix based on our design matrix x and that's fixed so i can move i minus h out of the expectation so i'm left with expectation of y y transpose times i minus h so i'm here so then evan said okay we can use a property by expanding this just as how we expand the second moment as a sum of the variance plus the square of the first moment so we can do that in the same way for the matrix so we would have expectation of y, y transpose. This is like the second moment equal to the covariance matrix of y plus the expectation of y times expectation of y transpose. This is like a this is like an n by n matrix. Don't forget about that. So I'm having an n by n matrix in every term. So then for the first term, I know by the assumption of linear model, this is equal to sigma square identity matrix and dimensional. And the second one, we know that expectation of Y is actually equal to, sorry, equal to X beta, okay? It's X beta times X beta transpose. This is the key. Expectation of Y is equal to X beta. And it has nothing to do with our estimation fitting or beta hat. And then I can expand this as sigma square identity plus x beta times beta transpose x transpose. Okay, so then I can put this term into the trace. So in other words, the first term becomes transpose times i minus h, okay? So the first term is just sigma square times i minus h. And the second term becomes x beta, beta transpose x transpose times i minus h. And we can show that the second term is equal to a zero matrix. This is a zero n by n matrix. Why is that? The reason is if you remember, h is equal to x times x transpose x inverse x transpose. So putting this h inside, we can have a lot of cancellation and we can show that this is equal to zero. So I'm only left with this term, okay? That's the only term I have in the trace. So therefore, the trace of this, we have to write that is equal to sigma square times n minus p. So we conclude this argument that if you divide this term by n, on the right hand side, we will have sigma square times n minus p over n, not, which is not equal to sigma square. So that's why we say this is a biased estimator. And to make it unbiased, we should change this denominator from n to n minus p. Okay, so this is another way to show the bias directly without using the knowledge about chi-square distribution. So that's the just the clarification I added for our earlier part. Do we have questions? Okay, so now let's move on to our professor. Can I can yeah. I uh, just ask a question about uh, SSR one? Yeah. In the hand notes from lecture three, it shows that for the a slope, we should use the slopes from the full model. I think that's a mistake. So let me clarify that. I think that, that was a mistake. So the correct okay. one should be to use the reduced model. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now let's move on to our logistic regression. So, or generalized linear model theory. So in the last lecture, just as a quick recap, we said that in the general GLM, 
we have the random structure. as an exponential family distribution. Our response yi's are independently following exponential family distribution. With two parameters, we specify them as theta i and phi. So specifically, the density, the PDF, has the form fyi equals the exponential function as the density function with the form. The first term involves yi, theta i, and a function of theta i. In the, in the numerator, in the denominator, we have a function of phi, okay? And in the second term, it's just a function of yi and phi and not theta. And theta i is the location parameter while phi is a scale parameter. That's the PDF. And this is what we call exponential family. And we show that normal distribution is a special case of exponential family. And we can also show that Bernoulli binomial are special cases of exponential family as well as Poisson. Okay, so recall from our last lecture, the expectation of YI, which we denoted by the common notation mu i has a nice property. It is equal to b prime theta i, the derivative of b at theta i, and the variance of y i is equal to the second derivative b at theta i times a i phi. That's what we derived in the end of our last lecture. So we're going to use that for our for our discussion today. So you can see that this one actually gave us a natural link function. Okay, so let me just write down that systematic structure first. So in GLM, what we assume for the systematic structure is that there is a one-to-one -one monotone function G, invertible function G, that transforms mu i so that we can say this transform mu i is a linear function of predictors. This is systematic structure. And we give this product a name, eta i, calling it the linear predictor. Okay, so this is the notation and this is the systematic structure. So now what's left is how do we find this g? And here we can actually see that Naturally, given this relationship, that is mu i is equal to b prime theta i, then if we set eta i just to be the theta i, the location parameter in exponential family, then we have a natural link function. Then you can see we would have mu i equal to b prime eta i right, because eta i equals theta i. And then looking at this relationship, it's between mu i and eta i. That's what we need for the link function. Now we already have a relationship between mu i and eta i. We just want to take the inverse so that we express eta i in terms of mu i the other way. So that if this b prime is invertible, we would have eta i equal to the inverse of b at mu i, right? Then you can see that then b prime inverse is the, or is a link function. So it can be used as a link function. And indeed, that's what we call the canonical link function in the literature. So why do we call a canonical link function? The reason is that in this density function of this form, the theta i is called a canonical parameter of the CDF, of the, of the exponential family. So theta i is called a canonical parameter. 
And what we do basically is to set the linear predictor we are interested in to the clinical parameter, to be equal to the canonical parameter. That gives us this relationship between eta i and mu i. And that gives us this natural link function. So we call this link function the canonical link function. Okay, so if we look at our normal distribution last time, so if you look at here, okay, this is the B function in the normal distribution. So if, if you check it, B prime theta i is equal to theta i. So the B prime, the derivative is an identical function, identity function. So it's inverse, it's field identity function. So that is consistent with what we had known before that for linear model, G is just identity function. We don't need any transformation. And for Bernoulli, we can show that the canonical link function is just the logistic function with the right before we used before. Okay, so this is the general case. So you see that this can guide a lot of GLMs, right? We, as long as the random structure is in the exponential family. And with this canonical link function, we have a very nice property about the log likelihood of theta, the parameter we are ultimately interested in estimating. We need a log likelihood so we can use the MLE as the estimator of data. Before I go into that, I want to just revisit the question I left for you in, at the end of the last two lectures. That is about a question. Do we need an error term in GLM? The reason I ask this question is because in linear model, we specify a linear term for each yi as epsilon i. We consider that to be the random error, which follows a normal distribution with common variance, sigma squared, and zero mean. So how about those generalized linear model? Do we still need an error term? Anyone who wants to volunteer? Uh, I, I think the error term is, is specified in a distribution. For example, uh, if I have a binary data, I will have a binomial uh, noise attached to it. So, yeah, that, that's right. That's correct. That's the correct answer, Kangchu. So here, the this term, this the word, this expression, exponential family, already gave us the randomness uncertainty in YI. So we are not, we don't need to really specify a term to mean the uncertainty, to mean the randomness. So that is different from Gaussian because in Gaussian, we can always make a random variable that follows Gaussian into two parts. One is the mean, the other is a zero mean normal random variable. That's exactly what we did for linear model. But that's not the case for every random variable like Gauss that function said. So in, if the random variable is Bernoulli, taking values zero or one, then how can you separate the noise from the signal? You know the signal is the probability of being one, the pi i we have there. But then around that pi i, whether it goes down to zero or whether it goes up to one, that's not something we can really specify about random error term. So we just directly say why i follows Bernoulli pi i, and the Bernoulli specifies the randomness. And also a question, a related question is I want to ask you, whether these two things are equivalent. So one is that if I write G Y I equals to X I transpose beta plus epsilon I, the other way is to write as in our GLM, G mu I equals X I transpose beta. Are these two the same thing? This is commonly mistaken. Um, this is often mistaken, mis mistaken as GLM, I just for your information. Okay, but what's the difference between those two? And are they really the same thing?
And some people even think, okay, in the first one, they still have the epsilon as IID normal zero sigma square. This is a common mistake. So a simple way to see these two are different is by taking the expectation. So for the first one, if we take expectation, okay, expectation of GYI, we will see it's equal to XI transpose beta. While for the second line, we actually have mu I as expectation. So essentially we have G of expectation yi equal to xi transpose beta, okay? And we know that unless g itself is a linear function, we will not have these two equal to each other. So expectation of gyi is not equal to g of expectation of yi in general. And we know there's an interesting thing called Jensen's inequality. It's actually about when this G is a convex or concave function, what is the relative order of those two things? Okay, so it's equal if and only if G is linear. That's the only case. So that's why you see these two are actually different models. And what's the first type of models, if you recall? We give you an example for the first type of model, the box Cox transformation. So when we tra transform yi using the power function, that's actually an example of the box. That's just an example of this first type of model. So, but in fact, so box Cox belongs to this type and it's not the GLM we talk here. Okay, that's a clarification I want to make. Now let's come back to the GLM, MLE in general. So MLE of theta in GLM. As we always know that we're interested in the predictor effects which are encoded by beta. So then let's write down the log likelihood of beta. I'm, I'm going to skip the likelihood and directly go to log likelihood here. And I'll write the lowercase l theta. So by the independence of yi, okay, this can be written as summation i from one to n log of density by i. So we have this by having the joint density by product f f y i, and we take log then we can exchange the order of log and summation and change the product to summation and move log inside. So that's how we get here. And because we have the canonical link function, okay? In the canonical link function, so basically we can replace theta i, we can replace theta i by eta i. And then eta i is, is xi transpose beta. So we have that nice thing. So by the canonical link function, this log, and also by the density form, you see the log is easy. We just get rid of exponential and take the inside. That's the log. So we would have summation i from one to n, y i eta i to replace theta i minus b eta i over a i phi plus C Y I five. Okay, that's what we have. And then we're going to use the systematic structure linear predictor to replace eta I by X I transpose beta. So you see beta now enters the log likelihood as it should be. So we have Y I, this is scalar, X I transpose beta minus b x i transpose beta a i phi plus c y i phi. Okay, so now what's remaining is to maximize this log likelihood. And you can see a nice 
thing about exponential family is that we basically can ignore this term because it's not getting into, it's not involving beta. So when we want to maximize L beta in terms of beta, and if we take derivative against beta, we will only have the first term stays and the second term will, will be gone. Okay, then the key question comes, how do we maximize this? So we will maximize this by finding p-dimensional vector beta to maximize it. That's the question. And this is actually an optimization problem. So for most cases, we cannot simply take the derivative of set it to zero and have a closed form solution especially in the pre-computer age, without a, without a closed form solution will be a very difficult thing. So that will make the GLM not really applicable if we cannot easily compute it by hand or by calculator. Although nowadays we have with powerful computers, we can always solve the optimization problem use brute force, right? Even though the, like this function is not convex, we still have non-convex non optimization algorithm for that. But in old days, that's a very difficult challenge. So today we're going to give you some very basic high level, or I would say very basic introduction to optimization method, which in statistics education was not really a core part before. But nowadays, if you're working on something related to deep learning methodology or more complicated model estimation, like the stochastic block model, those kind of things, you will need to have some quite good knowledge about optimization to be able to derive algorithms to estimate parameters in those models. Okay, so we will just do a review of optimization and then we'll come back to this problem. So for some of you, this might be review. For others, it might be introduction. Optimization methods. So here we just simplify the question the other problem as to find a maximizer of a p-dimensional function. So here we have a function, p-dimensional, which means its domain is rp and its value, it's a scalar value. So it's not a vector value function. So it maps from rp to r. And our goal is to, so I'm going to stick with the notation beta so that's easier for you to see the connection. Although the nodes will use x find beta star such that f beta star is greater or equal than f beta for all x, uh, for all, for all beta, sorry, for all beta in RP. So in other words, we try to find a maximizer of f just as what we need for the log likelihood. So the, the basic of optimization for finding a local minimum, local maximum, sorry, I should say maximum here. So the basic for finding a local maximum algorithm is what we call the newton raphson method. So this can guarantee that you can find a local maximum, but it may not be the global maximum. However, if this function f itself is convex, it's concave. Then for a concave function, we can guarantee that the local maximum, there's only one local maximum and that's the global maximum. Okay, so here we're going to denote a gradient, okay? So the gradient of F, or let me define that first, a beta. So throughout this class, we call a gradient a column vector. So in other words, we write it as a column and the gradient is defined as the partial derivative of every dimension of beta. So it's partial f, partial beta one. That means the first dimension. And we evaluate its partial derivative at the current beta value and partial f, partial beta b, evaluated at beta. Okay, this is a concept from multivariate calculus. That's what we call the gradient. And we can go further. 
we can have a Hessian matrix. So a Hessian is, can, is the, just the generalization of the second derivative. So what it means is that now we're going to take each partial derivative. So you can see each partial derivative is also a p-dimensional function. It still maps beta from p-dimensional to a scalar. So now for Hessian, what we do is that we're going to take the gradient for each element in the gradient. So for each partial derivative, we're going to take its gradient again. So we'll have this as, we'll take the partial derivative of this against beta one, beta two to beta p. So what we do is that we expand that as a, as a row vector. So then the Hessian matrix, which we will call it H, F is still evaluated at beta, it will be a P by P matrix. So this is P by one vector and we'll have a P by P matrix. So what we have is partial square F, partial beta one square at beta two, partial square F, partial beta one, partial beta P at beta. And we go down here, we have partial square F, partial beta P from here, partial beta one, beta, and lastly, partial square F, partial beta P square, beta. Please also know that in some books, people may use, they call gradient by default as a row vector. So that, that's just their notation. So if you think about that way, then you will first have a row vector and for each element, you would get another gradient that becomes a column in the Hessian. But either way, you will have a Hessian matrix as a P by P matrix. And for many nice functions F, we can have the, so we can have a symmetric Hessian matrix, right? So it's, it's the same, no matter whether you take derivative against beta one first or beta P first. Okay, so, Another property is that if F is strictly concave, is strictly concave everywhere in RP, then this Hessian matrix will be negative definite. So you know, negative definite is just the general way or generalization of the negative number to matrix. We know that for one dimensional function, if the function is strictly concave, we will have the second derivative of this function everywhere as negative. So here we'll say negative definite. So then what's the Newton Raphson? It's going to use both the gradient and the Hessian. So the general idea of Newton, Newton Raphson is to use Taylor expansion to approximate the gradient. So we know that we want to set the gradient to zero to solve for the maximizer for a concave function. But the issue is that set, setting the gradient to zero is not easy to solve. So we'll have set this to zero and we'll have P equation to solve. So that may not be easy to solve. So we do not have closed form solution. Then what do we do? So if we approximate by Taylor extension. And we will have this form simplified as a linear function in beta. And then we can just set that linear approximation to zero for, solve, for solving the solution. So specifically, we can write this gradient as a vector, just bear in mind, as expansion around some current value I call beta zero plus the first order expansion. So we know that for this function, its first order derivative is just a Hessian. Hessian evaluate beta zero, and then we take the difference beta minus beta zero. So this is what we call the linear term. So still for the right-hand side, we, we think of it as a function of beta. So beta is only in the linear term and beta zero is considered to be our stationary point or the starting point, which we do not need to solve. We just need to solve for beta. So then we set this to zero. 
So if beta star is a local maxima maximum, if beta star is a local maximum of f is a local maximum of the f function, okay, then we should have this gradient to be zero at beta star. That's what we want. But we're going to use this approximation, okay? Then we can approximately have this f beta zero, delta beta zero, plus Hessian at beta zero times beta minus beta zero, beta star, putting it in. We will have this as approximately zero because we're going to use this to replace the gradient, okay? And we know that in the lo local neighborhood, this Taylor extension should work pretty well, just like we can use a tangent line to approximate a function at a point beta zero. And then let's solve this one instead, because this is just easy to solve, unlike this one. This may be difficult to solve, but this may be easy to solve. And then we can directly show that this beta star will satisfy that it is equal to beta zero minus x is our Hessian HF at beta zero, this P by P matrix, we take its inverse. Suppose that this matrix is invertible and we would have gradient F beta zero. So you see when this Hessian is an invertible matrix, we have this nice result. That is we can directly write the local maximum beta star in terms of the current point, the local maximum of this, I should add point everything around beta zero. Yeah, I should add this. So I can go from this beta zero to its local maximum by this calculation. So I only need the Hessian and the gradient and I'm good. So this is the general, this is the general newton raphson method. And this is the foundation of optimization. So then how does it work? It's an iterative algorithm. So I call this NR algorithm. And it's iterative in the sense that we need to run it for multiple rounds. So you start or initialize at beta zero, let me call it. And then at the kth iteration, you're going to go from the current beta k to beta k plus one. So you will update. And the update rule is that you are going to update beta k plus one as beta k minus Hessian of s evaluated at beta k. And I take the inverse of the Hessian and then multiply by the gradient of f at the current beta k. So I just keep doing this and until you converges. So you see, this is the how we work use the Newton-Raphson algorithm. So if we believe there's only one local maximum of this function, then we can guarantee that as we iterate and iterate, we will converge to that point as the local maximum. Okay, that's Newton-Raphson. And now in statistics, we know we have a very prominent figure, Ron Fisher, who invented so many things we use today. So Fisher has changed the newton raphson method to what we call the Fisher scoring method. So that's the next thing we're going to introduce to you. And it is the method that's directly used for MLE, for calculating MLE for generalized linear models. So Fisher scoring method. So this is used for GLM MLE. But later we'll see that even the special form of density function as exponential family in the GLM we talked about, the Fisher scoring can be reduced to a simple algorithm 
which we'll call as iterated least squares, so IRLS. That will be a special case of facial scarring in GLM and expansion family. So what's facial scarring? So now if you understand Newton Robson, the facial scarring is basically a modification of this updating rule by changing the Hessian matrix to the expectation of Hessian matrix when F is a log likelihood. So what it means is that, so it's just a modification of Newton Robson method. So that is, we will replace, so now in the log likelihood, so now here we're going to for, for maximizing log likelihood. L. And you can still see that the log likelihood in our case is a map from T dimension to one dimension, right? So what it means is that we are going to, re so the Hessian, we should write as HL, just L to replace the F, okay? And this is the Hessian function. So Hessian itself is a function, right? It's a matrix, oh, sorry. It's a, it's a matrix value function. What we mean is that we input beta as a p-dimensional vector, we get a p by p matrix as the value of the hashing function. So I'll describe this as, right, this is basically a hashing. So what Fisher change is that instead of using the original fish, the original hashion, let's use the expectation of the hashing. And this expectation is again a matrix value function. So now let me ask you. So when we talk about expectation, what is taken? What is it taken for? What does what do we consider as random in the expectation? It's, it only makes sense to talk about expectation when we talk about random variables or random vectors or random matrices, right? If there's no randomness, then it doesn't make sense to talk about expectation. Then what's the expectation here? About. Think about the likelihood. Maybe I can scroll down here. The log likelihood. Yeah, actually, I should make this more explicit to emphasize the randomness. So this is a log likelihood. Here I have capital Y, I should stick with that. Capital Y, I and capital Y, I and capital Y, I, capital Y, I. So now you should see it. Here the randomness is Y, I. So basically we, we evaluate the likelihood function at our observed data Y, I's. But we realize that our data are random. Right, they're random sample. So therefore, if we change y1 to yn to a different set of numbers, the log likelihood function will change accordingly. That's where the randomness is about. So when Fisher proposed this expectation, he's basically taking the average across all the possible samples, just as we always did in frequencies. So that's the expectation. So in other words, this is no longer based on our observed data, but it's taken over the distribution of our data. Okay, so I should say that this is not a matrix based on observed data. While the left side is, this depends on the numbers in our observed data. And the reason Fisher proposed this is basically for computation is business. Because you can imagine, just as the Hessian depends on observed data, the gradient also depends on observed data, right? Because the gradient is a derivative of likelihood. Likelihood, log likelihood depends on observed data. So if we just make this part not depending on our data, we can save a lot of 
computational burden. We can just use this, this derived from the distribution we assume. Like given the exponential family, we can actually have a closed form function for this expected Hessian, which was later. And then we can directly just apply that form to the current value beta k and we're done. So we don't need to involve our data points y1 to yn into the computation here. So we can save a lot of computation no time in task. And this is so important for our pre-computer age. Okay, so now in the following discussion, I'm just going to apply the Fisher scoring method to our GLM. So we'll actually we will actually derive what is the score, what is the gradient for log likelihood, what is the hashing of log likelihood. Okay, so maybe I should say here first. So just to so the update rule for Fisher scoring. So we're going to do beta k plus one equals beta k minus the expectation of Hessian at L, Hessian of log likelihood at beta k. Okay, I'm going to take inverse of this times the gradient of the log likelihood at beta k. So I'm going to talk about the gradient and the Hessian and expectation next. So for the gradient, of log likelihood, we actually give it a special name in statistics. We call it a score function. So if it's not e easy for you to remember, just think about the gradient, I think that will be easier. So, and because the name score function, we give it a notation S. So look at our problem here. So I'm going to scroll back to here. So you can see that log likelihood has the special form as the summation of log density of yi. So we're going to do that, right? Then here is, I'll just evaluate beta, is the gradient of log likelihood at beta. And if we write it out, is the gradient of the summation i from one to m, the density of yi, I'm going to make mark beta here. So you know that density involves beta as our key parameter. And log, sorry, I forgot log, log here. So of course, I can exchange this gradient with the finite sum, right? Move this gradient inside the summation. So I'm going to have summation i from one to n, the gradient of log f y i beta. So now I'm going to regard this log f function as a function of beta, not a function of y i anymore. We consider y i to be given and we think of beta to be changing as just in the function s and uh, it's just a function of beta, okay. So think of this as a function of beta, then log f is a p-dimensional function. It maps beta to a scalar. And if we take the gradient of this by the chain rule, we would have f y i beta. That's by taking the derivative of log, and then we move to the inside of log. So that will give me gradient of f at beta, okay? So it's still considered a function of beta. And now you see this numerator is a vector, p-dimensional column vector, while the denominator is a scalar. So we stick with the vector and the vector. And here, this one is a vector. So we should keep this in mind always. And then that's our score function. So clearly you see the score function is a map from RP to RP. 
So its input is a p-dimensional vector, and its output is still a p-dimensional vector. So one nice property we should mention about the score function is that given we understand the Hessian is random, we know the score function is also random, right? It's randomness comes from y1 to yn. A nice property about the score function is that its expectation is always zero. So if we take the, for any data, we will get a zero p-dimensional vector. And this is for all beta in RP. So for any beta you put it inside, you take the expectation for y1 to yn, you would get zero out. Okay, so we can easily show that by the definition of expectation. Again, we're going to exchange differentiation and expectation, or more exactly, integration with differentiation, just as we did for deriving that property of mean and variance for exponential time. Here, we are also assuming the log likelihood or the density, yeah, the density to be very smooth. And this is guaranteed by the definition of, of the density for exponential family. So given that definition here, we know this is a super smooth function for yi. So, and also for theta i, also our beta, once we use the canonical link function, right? So here, it becomes beta. Okay, so in the proof, we are going to write down the expectation of score function at any beta as just here, right? We are, we are here. So I can move the expectation inside a summation. So I'm going to have i from one to n expectation of gradient f y i beta f y i Beta. So here, yi, yi are what I take expectation for. So then inside the summation, each expectation, each expectation is only for one yi. And then I'm going to use the definition of expectation. We know the definition of expectation is the, the, is the integration of the term times the density, right? That's just, and then we'll do the integration. So by definition, of expectation. This gave us the summation i from one to n integration. Now I'm going to change this yi to the logger case just as an argument in the integration. Okay, I'll just say y. y beta f y beta. And I'm taking the density f y beta dy. This is our definition. Mm -hmm. And then you see that basically here, I can already simplify this by getting rid of the summation and say, and say it's just the expectation times n. Because these yi's of, oh, actually I shouldn't do that. No, I cannot. Because each yi has a different parameter here, right? It involves xi. So yeah, the densities are different. So I should still keep the sum like that. I don't have iid for y, I just have independence for yi. So, but given this integration as the definition of expectation, we can see that we have cancellation. So these two terms are canceled. So I'm getting an integration of the derivative of fy beta. That's it. And please bear in mind that here, this derivative or gradient is, is vector. So after the integration, we have vector. After summation, we have vector. That's a line grid that S is a vector. Okay, so then I will change the differentiation or gradient with integration. So I would exchange these two things. Then I'm left with differentiation, integration, f, y, beta, dy, okay? And of course, by the definition of density, this is equal to one. So I'm left with 
gradient of one. Okay, now here is a one function. Just bear in mind, it's a one function that maps beta to a value one. So that's what we mean by gradient of one. And this is, of course, as a constant function, it gives us zero gradient. So I'm having a zero gradient p energy. That's just how we prove it. And the key thing here is that we're using the exchange property of integration and differentiation based on the smoothness of our f in every dimension of beta. OK, that's the gradient I want to talk about of log likelihood. And we call this a score function. And for the Hessian, we still use the notation h with the sub-index L for log likelihood. So for the Hessian, just as a reminder, this is a p by p matrix value function, OK? And now we're going to derive the Hessian starting from the gradient. So we're going to, for each dimension here, we're going to take its gradient for each dimension of beta. So if that expands, so that, that gives us a p by p matrix. So I'll just write down that Hessian at any beta. We can show that it still pairs the sum, right, just the sum from here. And for each term inside the sum, we're going to take its gradient. It takes its Hessian, I should say. We're going to take the, sorry, take the gradient for each term here, each element in the p-dimensional vector. So that will actually give me this. This is regarding, this is from the matrix calculus. So I would have the, this is the denominator, right? So, so scalar, I'm going, to, I'm going to square it. So yi beta. For the numerator, I need to bear in mind that I should have two terms. Just as in calculus, we take derivative of, we take derivative of this, but keep this as the constant, keep this as this for the first term. And then for the second term minus, we take, we keep this, but take the derivative of this. That's for one dimensional calculus. And here we're going to use the matrix form. And we will bear in mind that as a result of two terms in the numerator should both be P by P matrices. So for the first term, we don't change the denominator, but take the derivative of the numerator because this is already a gradient. gradient. Taking a derivative again, give us a Hessian. So h f at y i beta. Please still remember that in all the discussion here, beta is the argument for our function. Hessian has beta as argument, f has beta as argument. And minus the second term. So the second term will keep the numerator, but take derivative of the denominator. Now we will still have a p by p matrix. So it will be the gradient of f at beta times the transpose of the gradient of f. Because our gradient is a p by p by one column vector. So p by one times one by p give us p by p matrix. That's the Hessian. Okay, and now, Let's look at the mm, expectation of the Hessian. And then you can see why Fisher proposed to use the expectation and that can simplify, simplify things. So if we take the expectation of Hessian, of course, we're going to take, we can separate this into two terms and take expectation of each. And the first one, we can actually show that it's, it has zero expectation. So the expectation of the first term, let me just put it here, i from one to n, f y i beta scalar times the Hessian matrix, y i beta divided by f squared, y i beta. So we can show that this has zero expectation by the same argument. So I can exchange summation with expectation, and then I can write expectation as integration. And then with cancellation, the next exchange expect 
exchange differentiation with integration, and I can still get zero. So I'm just going to skip that by the same argument as here. This will give me a zero P by P matrix. So I can ignore the first part. Then the Hessian expectation is just equal to expectation of the second part, right? So we, I'll just write the Hessian will be equal to, I'll move at the negative sign. And I will exchange expectation with the summation. I from one to M expectation of F square Y I theta. We have the gradient of F times the transpose of the gradient. That will be the expectation of my Hessian. And now you see, what is this? So if you look at this term, looking back to the score function or gradient function, so I can actually, if I assign each term a notation for our simplicity, if I denote each term in the sum by S i beta. So you see that here the i comes from y i and beta is the argument we are interested in. Like I said, we regard this term, the ratio, as a vector value function of beta. So I just call this vector value function. I define it as this gradient f of y i beta over f y i beta. I call that s i beta. So this is a vector, just bear in mind. Keep that one vector. Then let's come back here. You can clearly see this is just SI beta times SI beta transpose. So I can write this as negative summation I from one to M. Inside expectation, I have SI beta times S i beta transpose. Okay, so I'm just simplifying my notation here. And then I'm going to use an important property about S i beta, just as what I've shown here. So I, I basically see what I'm showing is that for the expectation of each S i beta, I get a zero p dimensional vector. So their sum is a p dimensional vector. So therefore, it's not just the score function has expectation zero, but each SI is also having expectation zero. So this is a zero vector as well. So with this, then we see I'm having expectation of, it's just like, as it's just like a quadratic term, right? SI times SI transpose. This is the P by P matrix. And if you remember the beginning, when I introduced how we derived that expectation of the MLE for sigma squared, we use this. So this can be written as, I'm going to use that again, the covariance of SI beta plus expectation of SI beta times the expectation expectation of SI beta transpose. That's the property we already see, have seen. So now given expectation being zero, this term can be ignored. So I'm having, so this is equal to zero. And this is actually a zero P by P matrix. So let's keep the dimension clear. Then I'm just having the expectation of the Hessian as the negative summation I from one to N, the covariance of matrix of S I theta. That's it. 
Okay. And actually in statistics, we give this term a name. We call that the summation of the covariance of SI beta. We give it a name, we call that Fisher information. So we call this the Fisher information and here is a matrix. It's a P by P Fisher information matrix. So what does this mean? Fisher information, if you have learned about it in the one for one dimensional case, where you have only one particular parameter of interest, like the mean parameter, the Fisher information is telling you, okay, given my data, how much confidence do I have for my NLD? So you can think of it that way. So it's just like once you uh, change the beta value, so the Fisher information matrix will change accordingly. Your data will stay as given, but the beta can change. So in the one dimensional case, so it's possible that when your beta is a certain value, the Fisher information is bigger. When beta is another value, the Fisher information is smaller. So the I beta can be plotted as a function where its value is higher for some beta, lower for other beta, given the data. So what it means is that if the true value of beta, maybe I'll just plot it here. So in the one dimensional case, okay, so I just say p equals one, that'll make it easier. So if this is i beta and this is beta. So what it means is that if your true beta lies here, then given your data, you can estimate this beta more accurately. But if your beta lies here, I'll just say beta one, beta two. If your true beta is right here, given your data, you cannot estimate so accurately. So it's just like this is, or you can consider, so beta one is, can be better estimated by MLD than beta two can. This is what it means. So it tells you that the data, how much agreement your data has with a particular potential true value of beta. So it gives us a very informative way, but it, it informs you. Okay, I should say that's the Fisher information. It informs you that you can only estimate certain beta values well enough given your data, but not other values. So for example, if your data are clearly outliers given a particular value of beta, right? Which means that given this beta, it is very unlikely for you to observe your data. And that is translated to that your data has a very small joint density given this beta value. That is equivalent to that given your data, this particular beta value has a small log likelihood. And then the Fisher information is basically telling you that part. So it's a very informative way to look at, to examine the parameter values and their relationship to your data. Okay, so now we see this nice result coming back to our theme. Once we take the expectation for the Hessian matrix, we see it's just a negative Fisher information matrix. And that's very nice because we know the Fisher information matrix is something we use so often and we can compute it without using our actual data. So that's just, we can compute the Fisher information function, right? So given a particular beta, we plug in that value just as our beta K and then we can calculate. So the data will not be used at all in this calculation. Okay, so coming back to the update rule. Okay, so here, now you can see, given we know this is Fisher information and this is negative Fisher information, we can just write this as beta K plus, minus becomes plus Fisher information at beta K inverse times the score function at beta k. So I'm using the notations and definitions we have just seen, Fisher information and score function. 
that's Fisher scoring method. So the scoring comes from this score function and Fisher, Fisher information. So you see now where the name comes from. And in many cases, especially for one parameter exponential family, we can often have the Fisher information matrix nicely not depend. So we can have the Fisher information matrix just equal to the Hessian. So what I mean is that you will see that you'll be happy to see that once you do this calculation, you are only, or once you do this calculation like that, you are only left with terms without yi. So in other words, this term itself becomes a constant term, not a random term. So you don't even need expectation. So in that case, Fisher scoring and neutral robson just coincide. They become the same approach. So let's quickly see that for logistic regression. So then you see that's the case where you don't even need to take expectation. So let's quickly do that before the end of today's class. In logistic regression, and we can also see that this is a canonical function, canonical link function. If you recall, we have derived in our previous lecture that the log likely to the beta is equal to yi times xi transpose beta minus log one plus exponential xi transpose beta. We talked about this in the uh, last lecture. Okay, so given this log likelihood, let's derive the score function. S beta is the gradient of the log likelihood and we take gradient against beta. So, and we'll have a column vector as a result. So keep in mind, we need a column vector. So why I say xi, we write it as a column vector. We drop the, we drop the inner product, or drop the transpose, sorry. And then for the last part, we are going to get, so chain rule again, first log, xi transpose beta. And then inside the log, so we know exponential will stay, but we'll get xi out. So exponential xi transpose beta times xi. So it's still a vector because xi is a p-dimensional vector, xi is a p-dimensional vector. And that's the score function. And then Hessian. We take the second derivative. So here, we're going to take the gradient for each term here against beta. So you see, first term is done because it's, it doesn't involve beta anymore. We only need to worry about the second term. And I can move the negative sign out first. And then here, you see that I'm going to square the denominator because it's a scalar. Okay. And for the numerator, the first thing is that I'm going to take this one as unchanged. And then I come to take the gradient for the second one, for the denominator. So then that will give me, I just write down the result, exponential xi transpose beta times xi, that's from the new here, from the numerator here. And gradient of the denominator will give me xi. I think I will have xi transpose. Yep. So I have my, I'm having a p by I'm having a p by p matrix times exponential xi transpose beta. So I should have it again. Okay. And finally. Oh, sorry. So, oh yeah, I think that's fine. Let me see. Yeah, I should, I should keep it, sorry. Times exponential xi transpose beta. That's my first term. Well, for the second term, I'm going to take the differentiation against this one again. So I'm going to have exponential i beta 
xi and I'm going to have xi transpose also and this will stay. Okay, and finally, so I'll keep this one plus exponential xi transpose beta. Okay, but you see that no matter when, no matter what this form is, then you can be sure that yi is already done. So in this case, the Hessian, once we take its expectation, is just equal to itself. So we don't need to, we don't need to worry about randomness because this term involves no yi at all. So in this case, the Fisher scoring is just equal to Newton Robson. We don't change anything. So we'll stop here for today. And next time we're going to apply Fisher scoring. So because this is just a general introduction, right? Next time we're going to introduce Fisher scoring to the GLM and show that why it is a special form, we can, why we can convert it to a special form called iteratively reweighted least squares so that we can just compute least squares within each iteration. And in the pre-computer age, that's very easy to implement. And still nowadays, this IRLS algorithm is used in the GLM function in R, so which is something good to know. Okay, so let's stop here and I'll see you on next Tuesday. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye, thank you. Professor? Yes. I just had a quick question. For the homework, this is, uh, I'm newer to R. Are we allowed to use certain libraries for some oh. of the? Yeah, uh, uh, unless I specifically said that you need to do the coding yourself. If I don't say that in the problem, you can use any package you want. Okay, awesome. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.